institutional defense and one for companies throughout the Midwest for over 10 years at this point. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I also blog when my work life allows me to do so. Uh, this, uh, this talk was born out of a frustration of dealing with vendors. Uh, what we will talk about with the skilled persistent threat is you, everybody's heard of an APT, and then everybody's heard of, of a script here, as if there's nothing in between that you need to worry about to defend your network. Uh, we are going to clarify that over the course of this talk. So why? There's a classic idea that we fear what we don't understand. Um, and left to devices, especially in security, when dealing with leadership and governance and anybody else involved, that fear will run rampant. Now a lot of this is we have adversaries that always come up when you talk to a vendor that you have Leo from the Matrix who's going to hack your network from anywhere on planet Earth, steal all of your data, and if you don't have our product, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it because he will always be better than you. At some point, even the adversary has to start at the beginning with no skill set. That skill set does not just suddenly turn on one day like their sleep agent who's been activated. It grows over time. Uh, and as adversaries will tend to continue to go after the same targets, hence persistent, you can track the information gained through laws from their attacks against your infrastructure to then build their life cycle and see their learning curve and when they have figured out what different processes to increase their capabilities and tool sets. And understanding this empowers the defender. And at one point we've all heard the, the bad guy only has to be right once to get into your network. Well, the goal is to make sure they have to be right a lot of times once they get in before they do it. So as I've said, there's more than just script kiddies on one side who graduate into APTs. There's this concept that if you're dealing with the Chinese, if you're dealing with the Russians, any other nation state, any other major APT group like a Fin7 or somebody, that their people suddenly one day wake up and they're jacked into the matrix and they can do all of this. Almost as if there's some modern day Levinsborn program for China and Russia to breed out genius hackers out of a pot and then they're coming after you. Truth is, it's more like a Pokemon evolution. You learn, you build your skill sets, make mistakes, build your skill sets, make mistakes, rinse, repeat. It's a slow evolution. This is true for us as we learn to become better defenders this is equally true for any adversary you will face. So as I said, there's this belief. You have your pod-born people straight out of the matrix. Russia, the matrix, China. And they're ready to go in the moment they sit down at a keyboard. And once again, growth in stages. So we're going to have a case study to help understand this growth in stages. Now, due to the magical world of NDAs that you deal with in information security, especially as a defender, there's going to be a good deal of this that is redacted. So we're going to talk in glowing terms without getting into specific indicators, because it was the only way I was allowed to give this talk. So in this situation, I have a friend I went to school with, God help me, hopefully not before you were born, uh, who was working for a small Midwestern college as a system. Now, he had an issue where there was a brand impersonation that went after the college, but in a weird way that the, co the college was more a byproduct, like the HVAC company that led into Target, but without the network actually being breached. It was brand impersonation that was being used uh, to profit off of the alleged connection of his fake entity to that brand. Now, one of the things we learned is colleges are .edu's, or at least the reputable ones. Most of them do not register that .com address. Adversaries are very willing to do that. Now, in this situation, the adversary registered a domain with a similar name at a .com to the university, claiming to be a project spun off from the MBA school that does business in a very specific um, region. The goal was, if you're in a country that is not aligned with the US, and not necessarily Russia or Iran, but somebody who's just not considered an ally, it might be difficult for you to do business in the United States. But this business, working with this Midwestern MBA school, will happily help you set up a business entity and start doing work in the United States 
for the classic nominal fee. So my buddy calls me in and says, we have this issue and we're digging around. We haven't found anything. Can you take a look at it for us? So you do a basic look because they have a site because they were notified that they somebody did business with this site. It didn't work out. So they called the college to find out where they're going. <laughs> This is how they discovered the site. Now, like a good adversary, who is was purely privacy guarded, so there's no information available. It's a common European host for anybody who does defense. You've probably heard of OVH in France. Uh, and if you really dig into this kind of impersonation, those letters might put you 1% closer to a stroke. Uh, there was no identifying information we could pull at this point, and the way they were spinning their IPs through this hosting site they would run it up on a different IP, almost like their server was using DHCP, and then they were pulling information directly from the college site, pictures, text, graphics, and just auto-loading it into whatever uh, fake business site they were putting up. Now, if you've heard of me on Twitter, I have a series of maxims that I think apply to information security and life. Number one with the bullet is give your adversary every opportunity to make a mistake. Once again, we're not perfect. We have stumbles in our growth and our learning. And on a long enough timeline, everybody will make a mistake. It turns out, this answer, like my corollary to the making mistakes is, is the idea of baseball's perfect game. There have only been 14, 15 of them in history. Randy Johnson threw a perfect game, which means he threw 617 imperfect games. So mistakes are out there, and they're more common than perfection. So I was having a discussion with my friend. It's, we've, we've turned up nothing. There's not much we can find here to do something about this. And he said a magical phrase. He says, this, God, this is just like last time they did it again. Again, tell me about again. What happened the first time? Well, a few years ago, this exact same thing happened. A bunch of money, there were some problems, they went dark. The difference was the domain name was one letter different. All right, well, let's go take a look at that old domain name. Now, we can see, you know, using like web archive org, we can see cache images of the old, old domain, or at least the design of it and the text. And it was basically a carbon copy of what they were doing now. And then when we went and used passive DNS to look at the who is data, you have privacy, privacy, privacy. One day where we have a full who is listing, privacy, 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 privacy. And as you track it down, at one point the adversary switched hosting providers. Got a better deal, was kicked out of where it used to be, who knows. When he made that switch, in the, in the process of making that switch, that little checkbox that says keep me private wasn't checked right away. So he registers and he removes his domain, gets everything set up, and then gets the email and realizes, wait, I'm not, I'm not private, I need to hide this information. So then they went back in and immediately on the same day, made that change probably as soon as they registered it, registered it and had everything go dark. Now, with that change, there was one moment when everything was visible. We had your standard listing. We have a phone number, we have an email address, we have a street address. So using that to pivot to more, more OS in, we find tied to that street address 40 other websites that show up. Like email got us 12 more websites, phone number got us 12 more websites. So one little hiccup, and now the picture is starting to open up. Now this is the point where we get to start building a timeline. We have a fixed point where we have data. At that point, you can try it many different ways. The tool that I find most useful and I loathe beyond belief, I'm sure you all have access to it, it's called Excel. If you've done any kind of hunting forensics, Threat intelligence documenting work, you will use this tool a lot. And hopefully you do so without getting really, really angry. So what we can do here is we can chart on, on any of these different sheets based on where do we see that email address? Where do we see any of these street address data showing up? And more importantly, as we get different points along those lines, we can build a master timeline so that we see what somebody does when. Now the concept of TTPs, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. It is the top of the indicator chain. Uh, it's the idea that zebras have stripes, cheetahs have spots, they cannot change these. 
It's similar to when you make when you do scrambled eggs in the morning, you make them the same way every time. It's how you learn, you build your skill set, and you continue from there. So here's our cute little info set graph, and we'll talk about or if, the evolution of our adversary. So if we took the data and we go from when they were at their best and work backward, what we first saw is, yes, they learned to just make sure privacy guard was enabled on the who is at all times. Then back when we go farther and we get before privacy guard, we see that they were using different email addresses to run the scams against a bunch of different zones. Primarily English speaking zones reaching out to people who are not friendly to those given countries. Uh, so you see different email addresses registered for doing business in the different regions. Uh, you start seeing the web server that they're using over and over and over. Over time, they started updating. But then you go far enough back in the timeline and you see, well, I just spent a brand new one. I can just use throwaway infrastructure. This gives us another data point that correlates to time. So we can see the web, or the web server version correlate that with time, and that's another point that is a, a trust but verify so we know the data is going in the right direction. Now eventually, they figured out, we want to be on a bulletproof host in one of those countries where we know they're not going to kick us off the service anymore. You know, farther back, you look at the phone number, the first phone number that popped up was a Google Voice number. You go farther back, you see an original Google Voice number that had an area code that was tied to the, the address that had been constant through all these registrations. Now you go farther back, you have a home phone number that is not a Google Voice number that also lines up to the original address that we used to pivot to get all of the data. And eventually, you get to a point where they realize they should only host one of these spoof domains per server. The idea is if something gets caught, they're only burning one part of their operation. Now, building a timeline, we reach something that is a bit of a unicorn in the information security space. We found the original web server. This web server was a, a really bad mess. You can see the birth of coding, learning HTML, learning CSS. And God help it, it still had the default credential set. So taking a look inside, we can see all the log, like from their logs, which God bless them, they turned on their own logs. You can take a look at where all the logins came from. And the overall majority of his, and then all of the logins, was geolocated to an IP address that lined up with the original phone number that lined up with the street address. So as we say in information security, especially threat intelligence, with high confidence, we know who the adversary is. Like we can put a name based on the registration of public records to that street address that we found the guy. And what was nice is we went and did a Google, like a Google Earth Google Maps search, and when it popped up, it showed us an empty field. But as we went down the street and followed it to one of the two directions we could go, we figured out that whoever did the surveying for that didn't line it up with geographic coordinates. So eventually we found a small little building that had three trailers just outside in the middle of nowhere, and it had a nice little address rock that had the four digits of the address out front. One of the buildings had a satellite dish on top, and a bunch of cabling running that was buried underground, that when you spun the camera around that Google Earth, across the street in front of the other, other side of the road where there's an empty field, somebody had put in a brand new cable box so that they could have fiber, fiber colo directly to their home. All right, we got through this 10 minutes early, we got a bar count coming up. Um, the basic takeaways are, Adversaries level up, just like we do. There's no, there is no, they start and they're Superman. Takes a little bit, they learn, they make mistakes. Those mistakes can be tracked. Be patient, be diligent. There's always more data points to find, which means there's always more data points to pivot on. And then if you're a defender, one of the other takeaways that comes away from this is, it's not always about getting your email. It's not always about getting to your servers. Sometimes the brand of your institution can have a value in and of itself, and sometimes you need to look externally to make sure no one's trying to abuse that brand. Uh, how else would that All right.
this was a relatively quick presentation for everybody. Uh, if you have questions, I'm here to take questions. Yes, sir. Good question. Um, don't some amateurs, even they get good, they get lazy, because if something works, why fix it? A good example of that is the Russians. If you followed anything APT 28 and 29 have done, um, there was a big discovery that they talked about at ThoughtCon, I want to say it was two years ago. Somebody from CrowdStrike came down to give his talk on, they were brought in to do the forensics on the DNCC servers. And they had found all this information where you had two Russian teams that independently got into the servers, didn't know the other team was there, and they started making a lot of noise, thinking the other team was missing responders and trying to knock them out. But then as time has gone on, like you look at like the Scripple case coming out of London uh, and any of the other actions by the Russians, and what has now become one of their TTPs is they don't care if they get caught. Because when they get caught, nobody does anything. So there's, there's a certain degree of, of built-in laziness depending on the adversary. Or the adversary then makes assumptions that the defender isn't looking, or they haven't found us by this point, so they're not going to find us at all. Uh, and that's where the trade craft can get lazy. Like going back, another good example was uh, well, with Assange in the newspaper today, um, Guccifer II, who was leaking all of this information. And they finally proved he was Russian because he was knocking out all this information. They could plausibly deny him being a Russian by saying he's logging in from Romania. And then one day, he logged in, posted a bunch of stuff to Twitter without turning on the VPN, and they traced it back to like a room of the Kremlin. Right, so this laziness does that white building or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You know, ultimately, FireEye the APT one report was the same thing. When they published the report, they made a big deal of having a guy out in front of like the, the PLA Third Army building in Shanghai. Yes, sir. Uh, we've been getting fish pretty pretty heavy from uh, the Netherlands. Is there something specific about the Netherlands? Are they well protected or? Um, I wouldn't so much say it's well protected. The Netherlands, as far as Europe goes, the Netherlands is one of the bigger data center areas in Europe. Um, I believe AWS has a region there. In the days before AWS really got big, I had worked for a couple other companies who had European data centers based there. Um, part of being where they are, it's easier to keep everything cool. So it is just a an easy place for people to spin up data centers, so it's an easy place to buy cheap server time. Uh, and then, if, especially if you're not in something like AWS that leases their own borders, they can send with near impunity, because the sheer volume of people doing bad things means it takes a lot of time before whoever runs the actual server farm can clean things up. Perfect. Go for it and drink. If you haven't been to the safe house, there may or may not be a password. It always of, is a Of course. You know, but, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. In, in honor of CypherCon, if you're not familiar with that, if you don't know the password, you get to do a funny little dance that is on screen in the little entryway that is on screen that everybody in the bar gets to look at and laugh at. So everybody who goes at least once gets to do a cute little dance. Now, also, the, the entrance is down an alleyway. Yeah, oh, God bless it. We, I think we were there two years ago, two, three years ago. So I'm looking forward to it because it's Speaker badge, I get to go back to where I have to dance. Uh, but even yeah, if I didn't, no password. Well, there, I do happen to know there's a special password to, for tonight, allegedly. I can't remember what it is. It's well, more of a passphrase. Uh, cough, cough for anybody who's paying attention. Uh, this is my way of being nice to all of you for coming to the talk. Uh, so thank you very much for stopping by. If you have any more questions or want to reach out about anything, um, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm somewhat active. Uh, more active than my blog because it doesn't require dedicated time to sit down and type something out for an hour. Thank you very much.